All right. Hey, Matt. Hey, Steve. How are, how are you? I'm well. How, uh, thanks, for, no, thanks for doing the interview. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Sure. Um, let's start at the very beginning. How did you fall in love with music? Oh, wow. You know, it was just in me from uh, the moment I was born, I think. I, uh, but when I really knew for sure, um, when I really fell in love with it was when I was on a camping trip with my family and my uncle broke out an acoustic guitar and I was all about it. So he uh, put it in my hands and I could just kind of play, you know, right off the bat. I, I didn't, uh, you know, know what I was doing, but I, I was getting pleasing sounds from the guitar and was pretty much hooked right then and there. Um, and my my uh, my family recognized that I had a natural talent and instinct for it. And so my grandfather bought me a, a little, uh, you know, three quarter scale acoustic guitar. I uh, had a few lessons, but was mostly self-taught. And then I, um, you know, in in the early 90s, when I was just entering my teens, uh, the Seattle music scene was really blowing up with Nirvana and the, the grunge yes. movement. And that really, uh, I'd always loved music. I was listening to a lot of classic rock and 80s rock. But when that hit, it just kind of was the right time in my life. I really latched onto that um, and really became a big part of my musical roots. Um, moved to Seattle, was in bands, and was working at a recording studio. And that's when I uh, became more aware of all the different forms of media that you know they need music for. Um, and I'd always loved film scoring as well. And, and I wasn't even really aware of the, the craft and art of film scoring, to be honest, as a kid. I knew I liked the music from the movie. I had no idea how these things were happening uh, until uh, probably my, my you know, teens. And then I started to become aware of like, oh, wow, this music from this guy, Danny Elfman's amazing. This music from, you know, John Williams is amazing. And, and so I had these kind of two um, different paths of interest. Um, and when I got married in my early 20s, um, my wife uh, kind of planted that seed of, have you ever thought about, you know, doing film scoring? And, and uh, I was like, wow, that's a really interesting idea. I'd never considered doing that myself. Uh, and so I, you know, got some books and ended up studying under a composer in Seattle named Hummy Man. And uh, that just kind of set me on that path and, and I never looked back. Okay. Um, here's a how the sources was made question. Sure. Um, can you describe can you describe the collaboration process you and a director have when you are first brought into a new film? Absolutely. Well, um, it's always a little bit different, but there's it's usually a very collaborative process. You know, I consider myself a, a small spoke and a very big wheel. You know, and the director has a vision, um, and all of these aspects: the editing, the direct, the, uh, the the cinematography, uh, color sound, music, they're all very, very important. You have to have everything working in order to have a successful movie. So, um, you know, I'm writing music to support his vision, to tell the story, help tell the story. And so uh, in the case of Your Lucky Day, especially, I mean, Dan and I, who've been working together for, you know, 20 years now, um, we sat down and had a three hour long conversation before I had seen anything. Um, I knew the basic concept of the film because I had actually scored the short version of Your Lucky Day back in 2010. Um, and so I knew the very basic premise, but of course, expanding it into a feature is a whole new um, ball game. And so uh, we talked uh, at length. Um, and then a few weeks later, I got a rough cut of the film. Uh, and then I just started throwing ideas at it. Uh, in this case, you know, a lot of times you have uh, what's called a temp score. Um, by the time I see the movie, they've been placing temporary music into the film to see how things are feeling, to get a sense of what it's going to be like with music. And, and since it's such a hard thing to talk about, it's such a subjective thing, music is, that, you know, it sure. helps to start a conversation. Um, in this case, we didn't really have much of a temp score. We just had spoken about a few references, ideas of sonic palettes that might work. And then Dan really kind of let me um, run with it. And so that was particularly fun. Uh, because I felt like I really got to be, you know, really creative and there was no real, um, sometimes the temp track can be a little bit almost too prescriptive. So it was nice to not have that and just to get to kind of go wild with it. Well, I you kind of skipped ahead to my next question because I did point out how you're lucky that he's actually the remake of the short film Dan Brown made. Yeah. Quick little note, Dan, Dan, we're talking about Dan Brown, but not the author Dan Brown. This is not the Vinci Code guy, Dan Brown, for anyone who's uh, listening in, by the way. Um, but yeah, you did that way back in 2010. So um, when you when you were contacted for this to be, you know, hey, you know, Matt, we're gonna, I'm going to do your lucky day, the feature length. Um, how did you approach that differently than you, than you did when you did the first score on the, on the short? 
Well, you know, the short uh, is only 10 or 15 minutes long. And so there's really only a few minutes of score in that movie. So it, that was very, very quick. You know, I think I spent a, maybe a couple of days and we came up with something that worked for the short. It was a very textural um, approach on, on that. Not a lot of um, thematic development or anything because it's simply just so short. It's really just setting a tone and a vibe in that situation. Uh, there's just simply not enough material to like try to create any real sort of musical arc, at least in that instance. Um, but um, I will say that, you know, they're both, they're both dark, but I think that the feature film, we really didn't try to link it in any way musically to the short. We, we took this as it's a new film, it's a fresh approach. Um, and so um, we still have a dark textural score, but one of the big differences, um, and this came from my, that first discussion with Dan, uh, was, you know, we had had this long conversation we're talking about different ideas and, the, and it's a, you know, I could tell this is a dark movie, you know, it's going to be a very moody film. And um, I said at the very end, is there anything that maybe we haven't touched upon that you'd like to see reflected in the score? And he said, well, yeah, it takes place on Christmas Eve. So I'd love to have a holiday element in there. And I was like, oh, wow, I hadn't even thought about that. I think maybe he had at the very beginning of the talk mentioned it was going to be taking place on Christmas Eve. But, you know, that was kind of the last thing on my mind. And I, and I thought, oh, that's fantastic because um, you know, it's challenging sometimes to blend those styles and to bring this joyful holiday feel into an otherwise very dark uh, score, but it also op um, offers opportunity to really do something different and creative. And so I think it's most of my like favorite moments of the score are when we're blending some of those um, styles together. Yes. Now, can you go back, you know, how you, the very first film you ever scored, how, you know, since you were a new composer, how you got even though it was so short, and how did how did you get picked for it, and how did you know how did you go about it, you know, you know what, what was the movie, and um, you know, how did you even get the job to start since you were you know hadn't done it before, and someone had to take a chance on you. Absolutely, I had um, well, it was a you know student film, which is a really good way if you're if you're brand new and haven't done anything. Those are that's usually the way that you're going to find uh, an avenue to um, for someone who's willing to take a chance on you because there's the stakes are low, you know, it's still very important uh, to the director and you want to do a great job. And, and but there's also there's there's no studio, you know, watching your every move. And you know. so um, the very first film I did, I believe, was called um, oh, what was the very first? It might have been a movie called Numb. And actually, no, there was a, a movie called Sideshow. Oh, a very a short film from a long time ago. Um, and it was through Chapman University. It was a student there. And uh, I think I just put my name in like they had, you know, if you want to compose student films, you can, you know, put your name up on our on our list and we'll, you know, you, you might be contacted. And so that's how that first film came about. I also worked at an audio post house at that time in Seattle. And so I was uh, in contact with a lot of creative people around town who were doing a lot of ad work. Um, and so uh, in fact, a lot of the crew and uh, a lot of the crew on your lucky day are people that I worked with way back then. So I ended up uh, meeting just really talented people who were, you know, on the side creating short films. And because we were friends and knew each other, they would hire me to, to score those. And, and that's really how I got um, started cutting my teeth on film. I was also um, scoring commercials as well. So that was like a great way of you know, you have to be, you're expected to write in a very, a wide variety of styles. It's usually only 30 seconds or a minute. So it's pretty manageable amount of time, but it's a really great way to kind of get used to the demands of, you know, writing for hire, under pressure, under a timeline, and that somebody has to, you know, sign off on it and be happy with it. Right. Now I said, your career does go back nearly 20 years. Can you recall a project that was especially challenging to make music for and how you got over those obstacles? Oh gosh, you know, I don't so long yeah, career you have. Yeah, you know, the beginning of every project for me is always, is always challenging, I think, you know, um, because it's like you're looking at that blank page or that blank computer screen or whatever it might be. And yeah, you've had the conversations uh, with the director and you have an idea maybe of what's going to work, but until you really sit down and start putting things up against picture and seeing how it feels, you don't know for sure that your ideas are going to work. And sometimes they don't and then you're back to the drawing board and I think it's just that getting that initial um, That spark of where you know finally and I don't know where it comes from. Honestly, it's almost like I just have to kind of, you know, work at it until 
some little moment happens and then I'll, that will be like my anchor point. And I'll think, oh, this, this is great. This is working. And then it'll kind of start to feed on itself. It's, uh, and then it becomes less me even thinking. And I feel like I'm just kind of, um, almost just kind of like, you know, in the moment and channeling the experience and it just starts to really flow. Uh, but it's that first, you know, those first few days oftentimes um, are, are for me the most challenging. Um, and then, you know, the other challenge of, of uh, a lot of projects is the timeline, you know, sometimes um, we had we had a luxurious schedule for your lucky day, but often, you know, you might have to score an entire, you know, feature length film of 80 minutes of music in less than a month, you know, and that's a lot to do. Uh, and so that can be very daunting as well um, when you just are up against the clock constantly and still have to deliver a good, a good product. Um, and what kind, what kind of equipment you work with? I mean, sometimes when you see like John Williams scoring a film, you see him have an entire orchestra with the, you know, the film going background. And um, I don't, you know, I don't know if you have that kind of access, but what, you know, what do you typically work with to get, you know, to um, write and compose your music with? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it runs the gamut. I'm asked to do a lot of different styles. And I think part of at least modern day composing, until you really have established yourself and, and maybe you become known for a certain sound more. Um, and oftentimes that's, may not even be what you set out to do, but it's you have a project that's very successful and suddenly you become attached to that type of style or sound. Um, and, and that's a, a blessing when that happens. But until that point, you're, you kind of have to be a bit of a chameleon, you know, you have, really have to have a lot of strengths. So I've I write for a uh, full orchestra, uh, total, you know, completely synth and anywhere in between. And with my band background, I also can do kind of more band related music, which like for like action comedies, things like that. Oftentimes they'll want more of a band approach with guitar and drum kit and things like that, along with orchestra usually. So, you know, I'm pretty versatile, uh, which has really blessed me uh, in my career. And I'm also, you know, having a background as a sound designer and when I was working in post in Seattle for, for nearly a decade, I was do mixing and sound designing. So I have a, a good sense of just kind of creating a sonic world for something and, and um, looking at it at, in terms of color and texture and not just music all the time. Uh, and these days, you know, there's a lot of hybrid scores where they're blending and, the, and blurring the lines between music and sound design. And, and oftentimes we'll refer to it as musical sound design. Um, so, uh, but yeah, you know, I've had really, really amazing experiences. Um, I actually just recently had the opportunity to go to Abbey Road for a week in London and record an orchestra there. And that was unbelievable. Uh, I love working with the orchestra. Um, it's so fun to see I mean, where else do you get to have, you know, 50 or 60 or 80 musicians all in a room playing your music? You know, it's a pretty spectacular um, occasion. What was the biggest amount of like musicians you got to work with on the score you did for a film? For a film, um, I would say about 60. Yeah. Yeah. And then I've done, uh, we had a larger ensemble for, um, I worked on a video game project once where we had about close to 80 people. Is there a genre of film you haven't composed music yet to, but would like to? And if so, what would what, um, what genre would that be? Oh, that's a good question. I would love to do a um, like a really like an Americana sleeping Western. That would be fun. Uh, and I've been tapped to do one, um, but it's been slow to get off the get off the ground. So we're, they're still in pre-production. And I'm hoping that that happens because I would love to to kind of do more of like that just classic kind of sweeping romantic, you know, um, Americana sound. It'd be, that'd be so fun. That's really, it's funny because sometimes I ask filmmakers, you know, you know, actors, directors, right? You know, what kind of genre have you worked on but, have, but haven't yet but want to? A lot of them say Westerns. Really? Maybe the Westerns <laughs> making a making a comeback. No, I, I recently saw um, a short film with Ethan Hawke and um, Mandalorian guy. Um, what's his name? Um, Ludwig Bernson? No, the guy, the guy who plays the Mandalorian. Oh, oh, um, oh gosh, now I'm drawing a blank too. Yes, they were in a short film western together recently. It was like 30 minutes long. So even you know, so you, if in, you know, so it was a short film which shows you know, if you have the right project, you know, actors will get on board with anything as long as you get the good material. Yes, and that's key, really. I mean, I think you know, I worked on a lot of shorts and things that didn't have any name actors or anything, and it's really good experience, and and it's imperative to. When, in the beginning to you know hone your skills and kind of figure this thing out because it, it's not something that most people can just sit down and and do it's definitely a challenging 
craft and art form. And, uh, and you really, in my opinion, you know, it, it takes a number of projects to kind of get your feet under you a little bit. Um, but once you get to that point, you realize the business side of it, you know, if you want your career to keep moving forward, you have to have projects that people are watching and want to watch and, and the draw is going to be, you know, an actor, you know, and uh, that, that they know or are familiar with. And so, you know, that's been one of the wonderful things about your lucky day is, you know, Angus Cloud um, was really, you know, blowing up in his career and, and sadly, of course, passed yeah. away. That was just terrible uh, and, a, and a really dark time for, for everyone. But, um, you know, it did, he is, he's got such a compelling presence on screen and, and already had a, a big fan base uh, in just such a short amount of time from, from the show Euphoria. Uh, so, you know, amazing that he was only 25 years old, uh, you know, and had already done so much, especially when you consider that he didn't set out to be an actor, you know, he was literally plucked off the street, you know, in New York, the casting agent saw him and, and said, Hey, you know, this guy looks like he'd be perfect for this character in, in uh, Euphoria. So, I mean, that just rarely happens anymore. I mean, most of the time I'm, I think I'm, Oh, who's this new actor I've never seen before. And then you look and they've been doing it since they were five years old, you know, they, they, you know, they've been at it for 20 years already. So, um, you know, it was definitely, it's very, very um, bittersweet, I guess is the right word that we have um, this amazing talent uh, in, in one of his last films, you know, I like, because at the very end credit, they, you know, the first thing you see is for Angus. I thought, I like that um, Dan put that in. Yeah, yeah, that was, well, you know, that was such a, such a huge blow. I mean, I think one of the last communications that um, Dan had was uh, letting uh, Angus know that we had gotten into the Fantastic Film Festival, uh, Fantastic Fest Film Festival. And, um, and that was the last text Dan ever sent him. It was, he never replied and he was, he would have, you know, just passed. So, you know, it was like, right as all the success and everything was starting to happen, uh, it was when that happened, it was when, you know, he, he passed away and it was definitely just, um, you know, a bit disorienting, I guess, but at the end, you know, we had something really special and, uh, and I think it's amazing that, uh, you know, Angus lives on in a way on screen and is still, um, you know, impressing audiences now. And, uh, and, and yes, you know, Dan, um, you know, I, they were, they were personal friends, I'm sure at that point too. And so that was a big loss. And, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm also really pleased that he dedicated the film to him and had that opportunity to do so. Now, now to me, music is, you know, very important to a film. I'll, as a film critic, I'll sometimes hit on that. I mean, I actually saw the Marvels last night and there's an action sequence where the music just did not match at all. It was just so distracting. It was just almost so irritating you know and I'll, and I'll and I'll you know and sometimes I see music scores where you I mean yeah music can be loud but sometimes the music almost is almost drawing attention to itself like you know here's the music score notice the music score horror films do that sometimes horror films can you know you know, scores are important but sometimes it you know it's trying to tell you okay this is the music that lets you know this is a scary part and it's just almost it, it draws too much attention to you to itself mm -hmm. so when you compose a film how do you make sure you know that you you want to, you certainly want to make sure that you you know you're getting the feel of the, what you want at this of, of this project but at the same time how do you make sure that it's not you know that it's just right under underlying so it's not a distraction yeah, it's tricky. And I think, you know, the mark of a great score is one that it does exactly that. It's not in the way. You're just, you know, the, the goal for everyone is that, you know, we want the audience to have an experience, to be transported to another world, whatever that is, and to be in that world. And they're not, I don't, you know, I never want them to be noticing the music uh, unless it's meant to be noticed. You know, sometimes there are scenes yeah. where it's a really dramatic scene and the music is, it's very music forward. And so, you know, they, you know, you hear that all the time in films where they pull all the other sound out and it's just the music carrying the scene. And it can be a very artful, beautiful thing. Uh, and in that, in those moments, you know, the audience, I think most of the time will notice, but a lot of times they don't, you know, well, you know, we're so used to looking and paying such close attention to how, like, as you put it, how the sausage is made, you know, and when I'm watching a movie, it's really hard for me to not be paying attention to what the music is doing. Uh, you know, it's kind of almost a curse at this point. I wish I could just turn that part of my brain off and sit back and enjoy the movie like, you know, everyone else. Um, but it's just the nature of it. And so, um, you know, it, it is very, uh, when, when someone tells me, wow, I, you know, uh, the movie was great, but I'm sorry, I didn't even really notice your music. To me, I take that as a compliment because I, I'm okay. I think that's a, you know, a job well done. They, they were absorbed in the film and it, they weren't being distracted by the, the music all the time. Um, so yeah, that's a, 
that's a really is a great question that I think a lot of people aren't even aware of how tricky that can be. And there's a lot of different ways of doing it. The biggest thing about, um, you know, scoring a scene in terms of the music being noticed or not, oftentimes is when you come in and when you exit the scene. And so I always try to find creative ways of bringing the music in, um, you know, whether it's when something else is happening, a, 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 you know, a loud sound maybe, or, you know, a, a, a kind of an emotional um, outburst or something from a character. Those are always good times to kind of sneak the music in because people's attention are drawn away. So, you know, you kind of learn the, the, some of those tricks over time. Um, I also love pre-lapping scenes. I've always liked that effect of when the music for the next scene, you kind of hear it coming in b before the, the scene changes. Um, and and uh, that's always a moment where I feel like it's a little bit more, you notice it, but it's a cool effect, you know, it's um, because oftentimes it's a different emotion than what you just saw I would call for. And so there's an interesting push and pull there for a second before we get to the end of the new scene. So, you know, there's little uh, devices and tricks that as you do this for a while, you, you start to um, realize, oh, I like that. I'm going to do that again. Have there been any projects you've worked on before where the director, you know, you compose, you compose the music, the director puts it in, looks at it, says, you know what, I know, Matt, I just noticed, you know, the, the music in the scene is not working on it. I just, it's just not, it's not the right score, you know, and, and, and he said, you know, can you give me something else? Has that ever happened before? Oh, that happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, you okay. know, there's, yeah, it's, it's always a back and forth because it's not even necessarily that it's, it's, it's not that it's good music or bad music or anything like that. It's just not what they had in, in mind, not what they had envisioned for their film. And so, you know, in the beginning of my career, it was always a really hard hit. That was kind of a blow, you know, it was like almost you hand this thing off that you've been working on for days or even weeks and you've put a lot of time and effort into it. And it's like your, your child, you know, and then you hand it over and then they say, yeah, this isn't right. And you're like, oh, you know, and, and it's kind of gut wrenching. Um, and so, you know, but over time, what I realized is, you know, and I, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, they're not, they're not creating a video for my music, you know, they're not, hey, this isn't a music video, they're, I am writing music for their film, it's their story, and so as long as I focus on what is it that they're trying to say and tell, and usually through conversation and through back and forth, um, you know, we get there, and so, um, you know, in the case of Your Lucky Day, there wasn't a lot of revisions. I mean, kind of like right off the bat, you know, Dan was liking most everything. Maybe there was a few small changes here and there, uh, which is very common, you know. Um, and of course, you're getting changing picture all the time, too. So you got to you got to rework the music to fit the ever changing edit. Um, but uh, we did. And I always love to do this. At one point, we had essentially the complete score written, um, you know, the first the first pass of the entire score. And it gets very granular, you know, you're focusing on scene, 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 scene. And so, um, you know, and everything's working and I'm sending, you know, the, the director clips that are just the scene and yeah, this looks great. And then you sit and you watch the entire thing and is it all working in a cohesive way, you know, across the entirety of the film. And usually that you'll find, oh, we're getting a little slow here. We have like three or four cues and scenes back to back that are all kind of slower paced and it's starting to feel like it's dragging. Maybe we can add a little pace in the music here to help that along. Or, oh wow, this old, like in the case of this film, um, you know, when we watched all the way through, we felt that maybe we're skewing a bit too dark overall. Like we need to find some moments to add a little bit more levity or just a different feeling than just dark brooding tension because it is a very tense film. And so um, that was a great opportunity for us to go through and where can we sprinkle more of this holiday feeling into this and kind of give a little bit of a different point of view and a different texture and, and lighten things a little bit along the way. Cause you know, we, you wanna have fun. You don't wanna have to have it be, um, you know, too much of one flavor, so to speak, uh, over the entirety of the film. Right, and I also sometimes will point out to people how, you know, just because a great score has got to be in the right setting. I said that two great scores is like the theme from Jaws and the theme from Halloween. I oh, said, yeah. you know, those are great scores. Reverse and put the theme from, from Halloween and Jaws and vice versa, and actually they wouldn't work. Right, right. So you have, you know, so it's, you know, I've always thought, you know, it's, it's an interesting experiment how, you know, you know, the right score, you know, you have a great score, but it's got to be in the right picture. It can be quite humorous as well. I was actually working on another film while I was um, working on uh, Your Lucky Day. And, um, and it was an action comedy. And uh, so there, you know, 
and I have the way that my system set up, I have uh, my, the picture is actually hosted on a, on a different machine. And so I'd forgotten to change the picture from what I was working on to your lucky day. And, um, uh, and I pulled up a, a, a cue and, and it was a very dark cue and it was playing underneath this comedy moment on the other film. And it was, it was really hilarious. I actually bounced it out and sent it to a friend of mine. I was like, you got to check this out. Cause this is, it, it was uncanny how things were lining up. So it almost seemed intentional. Um, it's kind of like, you know, when you see, when they do like, what if Mrs. Doubtfire were a horror film and they do the trailer and it's, yeah, I've seen those. those are fun. Yeah, it's very funny, you know, um, but yeah, you're right. You know, it, it's hard to imagine jaws with any other music you know it's hard to imagine any any of john williams scores being any different than they are he's such a master at that uh and those themes become just part of the film to such a degree and and in those cases they're obviously classic i mean halloween is such an amazing score and the fact that john carpenter did that himself and you know as like an almost an afterthought, you know, is the very end of the project. And he's like, well, I've got three days. I better score this thing too. You know, I mean, and to do that, I, I just, what a genius, you know? Oh yeah. I, I, I it's funny. I, I met him once. I, I, I've interviewed him before. And one of my first, ex, in, the, in the first thing I asked him was how do you create tension? And I actually said the first thing, his answer was, you know, well, silence first. And so, he, yes. you know, he, you know, so he don't think it's but he knows how to, you know, when to use music and when to not use music. Right. Right. And that's a big thing too, is when, you know, most movies these days, especially like, you know, big studio releases uh, are just wall to wall music, you know, yes. if it's a three hour film, there's two hours and 55 minutes of music in it, you know, and whether it's score or song or whatever, there's pretty much something always happening. And you end up with just a massive amount. And that gets very challenging because, um, you know, it's it can be fatiguing. Um, but, you know, it also depends on the style of the film. And it's kind of become part of the style of like an American tentpole blockbuster movie is that there is music happening all the time. Um, but, you know, uh, horror films or drama, anything really, the power of not having music is pretty amazing. And it can be uh, it can be really one of the most dramatic things you can do, especially in a film where there is a lot of music to suddenly pull that away. That's a big statement, you know, so it's it's fascinating to play with those techniques. Um, and I really do enjoy films. Um, I've always felt like a lot of like, you know, foreign films tend to have less music. Uh, and it's interesting to watch and just the different feeling that you get when there's a lot less music happening and you're really just, you know, feeling it's a much more naturalistic experience, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, it, silence is, is very, very key. Okay, uh, last question. Um... Can you describe the feeling you get when you see a film you composed to music for, you know, the first time you first time you see the music that you did for the first time in a theater, like, you know, your film, that feeling you get when you see your movie, you know, you haven't seen it before, maybe seeing Crimson Cliff, but now you're seeing it with the editing and everything, what that feeling is like the first time you see it. Oh, it's, uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's scary. <laughs> you know, It's like, you know, it reminds me of going up on stage when I was younger and, and playing, you know, it's your, your energy's up, you've got butterflies in your stomach, you know, the adrenaline's really going. Uh, and, and, you know, and that's how I feel um, when I'm walking into a setting like that. Uh, and, and it was definitely the case with Your Lucky Day. Uh, you know, we, we had our world premiere at the Fantastic Fest in Austin in September. And uh, there was a lot of buzz about our film, too, which was exciting. So there was a lot of excitement about it. Um, and um, when we sat down and the audience was there, uh, you know, and then the movie starts and people are reacting the way that you hope you know because you, you've lived with this movie for so long you know every scene and after a while it's easy to lose objectivity you know you're like is this a scary moment or is it not is this funny is this not funny you know you you hope that it is and it is to you but it's also you know you get so close to it so it's great to like sit there in the room with a bunch of people uh, i love the theater experience i, I hope it doesn't ever go away um, and, you know, seeing everybody react, you know, and, and getting that payoff because you're like, oh yeah, we did our job well, you know, these people just all jumped and now they're laughing and having a good time. And it's a, it's a fantastic feeling. All right. Well, Matt, thanks for having, doing this with me. Um, I hope the film does well and I hope, you know, continue success and, uh, um, hopefully I'll talk to you another day. I hope so too. Thanks so much, Stephen.